Good morning. I'm sure that clock on the wall is wrong. It can't possibly be 10 o'clock, but it says it is, and I'm sure that's what Grady's going to go by, so we better get this show on the road. I'll have the opening prayer this morning. We want to welcome everyone. It's a beautiful day, and glad you could all come out and worship with us today. It's, uh, it'll be a great experience. Let's begin with an opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much as we start another service for all the blessings you've bestowed on us for our entire lives and certainly in the past week. We thank you for our health. We thank you for our families. We thank you for the country we live in where we can give thanks for the history we have and, and the people we know. And we thank you for this church and for your son. We hope as we sing songs today and listen to words that are spoken and think about your message that we come away with a better understanding and a better commitment to be better people throughout this next week. Please be with us throughout this service and in the coming week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Our first song will be Lord, we come before thee now and we'll sing three verses. <laughs> second prayer we'll sing sing to me of heaven we'll sing two verses <clears throat> Pray with me, please. 
Father, what a privilege it is to come to you in prayer like this, to bring up our praise and, and petitions to you, Father. How we thank you, Lord, for each blessing you bring to us. Father, may we never forget that we depend on you for life. Our physical life, Father, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, Father, is from you. And Father, you're responsible and, and we can thank you for our spiritual life as well. And Father, we thank you for the redemption we have through your Son. Lord, we bring to you our praise, our thanks, and we also bring to you our petitions, our requests, Father, because there are certain things of which we have no control and that we bring to you and ask that, that you might bring comfort to these situations, that you might even resolve them if it be your will. And so, Father, we think of those who are ill or recovering from surgery, such as Robin Jones and Roy, our brother, whose shoulder is getting better and better, and we thank you for that. We think of Ed Lawrence, who's at home at the present time, recovering from his kidney transplant and improving each day, and we thank you for that. And as we speak, Father, in this prayer right now, Dave, a brother-in-law of Flo Mata, is undergoing heart transplant surgery, and so we pray for that successful surgery. Father, we have families that, that are broken or, or, or divided or otherwise and under stress, Father. And today, Walter and Carolyn Bickford brought to us concerns in their family for their daughter and son-in-law and their grandson. And Father, we ask that you might give them comfort and strength to, go, to, do, the, to the, do those things for their daughter, Melissa, and their son-in-law that they need to do and for their grandson, Romeo. They appeal to you, Father, through us that you might uh, help them to uh, comfort their daughter and son-in-law and their, and their grandson, Romeo, and, and be as much help as they can be in their older age and, and, and in their afflictions with pain. And so, Father, we bring that prayer to you this morning and ask that you might help that family, help resolve the situation within that family per their request. Father, we ask that you would watch over all these folks that are listed in our bulletin as sick or recovering from, from illness or otherwise, Father, requesting your comfort and care. And Father, we ask that you watch over the Pikes Peak congregation. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Can we please stand up for the scripture reading? This morning's scripture reading is coming from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 through 6. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we disturb the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servant for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our heart to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Amen. You may be seated. That's another familiar reading that Joseph has led us in, the Apostle Paul writing to the saints in the city of Corinth. And he acknowledges some very basic and we might even say some obvious truths 
Paul says, to paraphrase him just a little bit, I'm careful of the way that I act and the way that I live. I know that others are watching, others are listening, and how I behave reflects upon the community of God's people and the calling of God Himself. And so I'm careful not to <coughs> hamper, to limit, to derail my ministry. I don't want the failure be because of my failure. But then he also acknowledges that even at best, it's hard enough to reach people and to teach people and to bring people to the love and the grace of the Almighty. And he makes mention of the God of this world. And there's our endless battle. There's our everyday struggle. And there's our deadly enemy. And there's the deadly struggle and battle that confronts us every day. We sow seed and the evil one tries to sweep it away. We try to be a light. But we're a light in a world of darkness and dominion. And so here's the elemental battle between Satan and all of his forces and any newspaper headline every passing day confirms that he's pretty much in control of this world. But then there's the gospel that brings us into an altogether different kingdom and the blessing. Notice that in this text, Paul talks about the gospel being veiled or shrouded or hidden. The word there, the word calypto, which is neither here nor there, but it's a word that's found eight times in the New Testament and it always carries the same idea of something being covered up and hidden from sight. VBS, it's a delight as we gather in the auditorium. I'm sure our kids sing it in their classrooms, but I'm not down in those classrooms. But I like to hear them sing, hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine. Well, in the gospel account, when Jesus said, don't let your light be hidden, well, he's using the same word that Paul is using here. In the gospel accounts, that storm on the Sea of Galilee, and we read that the little fishing vessel that Jesus and his disciples were in, and it was covered by the waves. Well, it's the same word that Paul is using here. As powerful, as wonderful, as the gospel of Jesus Christ is, it can be covered up. And you notice that Paul says, when it is, people are blind. And he equates unbelief with blindness. And so he says that we want to live, we want to teach, we want to proclaim, we want to be a beacon. And not let our gospel be veiled. But there's one sentence, one phrase in this, that I'd like to draw particular attention this morning. And there on the bottom of the monitor, we put that in red letters and capital letters. The light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. And... There's a word cluster indeed. The light of the gospel. And that's one of the most powerful images that the mind can contemplate. John chapter 1. Jesus was the light. And the light shone in darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. Jesus was the light of God coming into the world. And here Paul talks about the light shining in our hearts. 
And what a wonderful description that is of the Christian life. The light of the gospel. And as you know, gospel, that's the good news. The light of the gospel. Of the glory of Christ. Now then this morning, it's very likely that many of you are reading from a translation other than the New King James. Or the translation that Joseph was reading a few moments ago. And here's the way that it's worded in some others. This is the New Century Version. The devil who rules this world has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. They cannot see the light of the good news. The good news about the glory of Christ who is exactly like God or in the image of God. And so that's a different wording that's good to think about. Here's the old King James. And you notice the phrase that I've highlighted. The glorious gospel of Christ. I like that word glorious. We overuse our words Sometimes we use them in so many different ways they kind of lose their punch and their meaning. And I'm sure you've made the same observation or you've heard others make it. Take that word awesome. Well, it can describe a piece of pizza or a flavor of ice cream or a sunset or a sunrise or Good news that comes, like a kidney transplant or a heart transplant, and that's awesome. Well, the word awesome is, pardon me, awesome. But sometimes we use it indiscriminately and it begins to lose something of its wonderful force. And the word glorious can be that way. But when we look at how the word glory or glorious is used in the Bible, it sometimes describes that which is transcendent and that which is just too wonderful to put into words. You might want to look at Exodus chapter 15. Chapter 14, the verse before. The Israelites were at the Red Sea. They crossed over on dry ground. They looked behind and here came Pharaoh's army and then the sea closed up and Israel was delivered. Chapter 15. All the Israelites broke out in song and praise. And there we find four times in that song of deliverance There's tribute made to God's glory. And if we had seen that sight, hard to imagine an arm of the sea suddenly being divided and the wall of water on either side and then collapsing upon the helpless Egyptians. Verse 1 and then verse 21 of Exodus 15 The Lord has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider. He's dumped into the sea. Your translation probably doesn't read that way. But that's what they're getting at. In verse 6. The right hand of God is glorious. And then in verse 11. God is glorious in his holiness. One, two, three. Four times in quick succession, Moses and Miriam, they sing about the glory of God. 1 Chronicles chapter 22, David is contemplating building God's temple. He'll not be able to do that, but his son Solomon will. But David said, the house that will be built to the Lord must be exceedingly 
And then David says it must be wonderful. It must be magnificent. It must be famous. And it must be glorious through all the countries. Now then this morning we're glad to be meeting here in our warm auditorium. And you're sitting on padded pews which just encourages me to preach and preach and preach and preach. And we're happy that we have this building to assemble in. And yet there's a difference in a church building. And the temple. The temple was to reflect Almighty God. And when different foreigners came to Jerusalem and they looked upon that magnificent structure, they would connect the dots. The God who lives here whose presence is represented here. He must be God of God, King of kings, Lord of lords. The Apostle Paul would write in Ephesians chapter 5 about the glorious church. Not having spot, nor wrinkle, or any other blemish. And the people, the family of God, it's a glorious thing. And this morning, aren't we so privileged to be a part of that calling and that sweet fellowship? So the glorious gospel, Paul used that expression one other time. First Timothy chapter one, verse 11, the glorious gospel of God, which has been committed to me, but the glorious gospel. And here's the way that we're going to develop the lesson this morning. It's pretty much basic. This is kind of meat and potatoes preaching. These are facts that all of us have known for so long. And yet it's good to be reminded of from time to time. Why do we say that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. How is it glorious? Well, in the first place, because of its origin, where it comes from, who gave it, who authored it. Paul would write in Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 11. I want you to know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me was not of man. Paul says that I wasn't taught it. I wasn't given to it. I didn't go to school. I didn't read it in a book. I didn't overhear somebody else saying this or that and put pieces together and come up with the finished form. He says, I want you to know that the gospel that I preach was given to me by revelation. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, I delivered unto you that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Paul says, we pass along what God has put through us. And I think even though that's an obvious fundamental assertion, we do well to mull on it just for a moment this morning. Sometimes criticism, misunderstanding, makes us hesitant and we back off. It's like we're trying to get other folks to be just like I am. To be just like you. And we have constructed a model, an ideal. And we're trying to get everyone to conform to our notion of godliness. And that could not be further from the truth. This morning, this room is filled with a very collection of sinners. Forgiven. And the only difference between us and anyone outside Christ 
is that matter of forgiveness which doesn't come from within us of our own volition, but that's the sovereign act of Almighty God. Paul says it would be something, I suppose, to brag about if we came up with our own unique system. Our best idea, our way of thinking, and the answers to all the troubles in the world, and wanting to make others kowtow to our notion of how things ought to be, Paul says this is what the gospel is. It's the good news. And it didn't come from any man, any woman, any rabbi, any prophet, any priest, any council, any church, any other deliberative body. This is the mind of God that we want to declare. And we're just a throughput. We're just a pass along. We're just a link. Now then look at any chain. And a link is important. You break a link and you break the chain. But the link only is important because it's a part of that system and a part of that whole. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is glorious because of the Spirit. The attitude, the desire, the feeling, the emotion, and all that it entails. Paul will write in Ephesians chapter 4, we speak the truth in love. There's not a star in our crown. There's not a gold star on our report. There's no credit. There's no bonus. There's no dividend. If we browbeat someone into accepting our way of living, our way of thinking, that's not where we're coming from at all. We speak the truth, and sometimes the truth can be blunt. It can be unpopular. It can be persecuted. It can be silenced. It can be intimidated if the world has its way. But we want to speak the truth and we want to do it in the most loving way possible. That makes the gospel glorious. When others can see and know where our heart is. And what our desire is as we try to reach the world with the good news of Jesus Christ. The gospel is glorious in its aim, in its intent, in its design. What do we want to accomplish? Well, it's not some great building or edifice, not like David thought about building the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. It's not some sort of society, club, organization, and it's elite in its nature and membership. What we're trying to accomplish for others, is the same thing that we seek and so desperately need, the salvation of our soul. And what else can do that save the gospel? In Galatians 3 and 28, Paul says, Now then there's no more servant and master, bond and free. There's no longer man nor female. But we are all one in Christ. And in our modern world, that's a verse that sometimes is twist and pulled from both ends. Paul is not saying Jesus wants to eradicate nationality, 
We can't be Americans? Is that what you're saying, Paul? No, that's not the point. Well, let's just blur the line on gender and there's no more distinction between man and woman. Well, that's not what Jesus was wanting and getting at either. And with the coming of Jesus, slavery, either real, literal, manacled people, or people so disenfranchised that they're still under that burden, even if they're not slaves in that exact sense. Jesus didn't come to make utopia on earth. We're going to find that in heaven. But what else can the Spirit of Jesus unite every woman of every color, every creed, every nation, every generation, every age group, every economic strata? Where else can we find harmony and love save in the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ? And then number four, the gospel is glorious because it's for everyone. Hebrew, the Hebrew writer says, we see Jesus, chapter 2, verse 9. He was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, that he might be crowned with glory and honor, how that he tasted death for every one. And the Hebrew writer writing to a Hebrew people, their whole history, their whole heritage was one of separation. They were the chosen. Everyone else was lesser. And here was a fundamental revolutionary point the Hebrew writer was pressing to his own people, our Lord Jesus died for every one. Thank God. Because that covers me. And that covers you. The glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul says that's why we endure what we endure. That's why we suffer what we suffer. That's why we undergo the hardship and the peril and the persecution and all the things that abound to us because we have this end in view. One faith, one Lord, one body, one spirit, one calling, one baptism, one being one in Jesus Christ. That's the glorious message, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. This morning, I think we might have some with us, and your pressing need is to submit to the gospel. Not to me, not to the Pikes Peak Church way, but to the gospel. It's the story of Jesus. Do you believe that He lived? Do you believe that He died for your sins? Do you believe that He rose again on the third day? If you believe it, would you declare it? Would you confess it? Would you shout it? Would you acknowledge it? Would that belief be so strong it would make you stop dead in your tracks, turn around, and start a brand new walk of life? The Bible calls that repentance. Would you obey His command to be washed in His blood, be buried in the waters of baptism, and arise to walk in newness of life? And then the glorious gospel will be your own glory. This morning, might we witness your obedience to the gospel, the glorious gospel. Let us know as we stand and as we sing together.
Bickford comes forward, and and uh, and and you all heard the the prayer earlier that, that John did, t- talking about their family situation. But uh, <clears throat> Carolyn is also in a lot of pain; she's needing to have surgery. Um, so we we want to we want to pray about that, but also uh, Carolyn's uh, needing some needing some help in the home, to, uh, and so she she she'd like to to be able to find someone to. To help out with some of the, the work that has to get done while she's while she's in this situation, so we want to we want to pray for that too, and, uh, and 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 let's pray. Dear Lord, we 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 come to you on behalf of, of Carolyn Bickford and and Walt and, uh, and and their family. We'd ask that you'd be with them as. Uh, as Carolyn is going through this this trying time of of having the pain and the surgery that she needs to have very soon, Lord, we we pray that uh, when it when it comes to that, that that you would that you would help her through this. Be be with be with them, the family, the people that are would be that would be looking after her, doing the surgery, uh, and and caring for caring for her, uh, uh, hopefully uh, in a very soon. Father, we pray that, that your healing hand would be upon her and that, that she would receive some relief from this. But Father, we also pray for, for the Bigford family and, 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 uh, and, and the situation that they have, having difficulty getting things done in their home. We pray that, 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 uh, that she might find someone to, to come and help uh, uh, with, with that situation, to, to help, help them through this time. Father, we know that, that uh, when, when we're where when we're in pain when there's things going on in our life that, that the other things don't stop the other needs don't stop and so we pray pray for them that, that these things would be taken care of and replace these things in your hands father we pray that that uh, that, that those that the, that the people to take care of these things would be found and and that they would they would be effective in helping uh, helping her through this time and it's in Jesus name we pray amen This will be our song before the Lord's Supper, and we'll sing two verses.
Jesus is identified in a lot of different ways by a lot of different uh, imageries uh, throughout the Bible. Uh, in Judges, we see him referred to as the angel of the Lord. Uh, we see him referred to as the Lion of Judah. Um, we see him referred to as a shepherd, as a gate, as a doorway, as a servant, a lot of different ways. In John, uh, the first chapter of John, when Jesus is really first introduced uh, to the world and in his uh, the beginning of his ministry, when John the baptizer introduces him, uh, John says this about him in, in verse 29. And said next day, or the next day, he, that is John, saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now the Jews to whom John was speaking at this time, the Jews who had come out to, to hear John preach, they would have been very, very cognitive of the idea of what a lamb that takes away sin was all about. Because from the giving of the law of Moses, this had been a part of their life. The sacrificing of a lamb, the slaughtering of a lamb for the forgiveness of their sins. And so they were very in tune with what John was saying when he pointed to Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Jesus is the Lamb of God, and He takes away our sin. One of the things that I kind of mentioned just a little bit ago, the Lamb to take away the sins had to be slaughtered, had to be put to death. And so here in one of the initial introductions of Jesus Christ to Jerusalem, he's identified as one who was to be put to death. Behold the Lamb of God. But in that death, in that sacrifice, he takes away the sins of the world, yours and mine and those of that day. Those who lived before John, his blood reaches back. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world for all time. As we partake of these emblems that we, we now have, um, We do this, as Jesus said, in memory of him. And in particularly, in memory of that sacrifice. Seeing him in our mind's eye as the Lamb of God, as he takes away the sins of the world, being sacrificed for us and for our sins. Would you pray with me, please? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the lamb, your lamb that was given and sacrificed for us. We partake of this bread at this moment, thinking about his death, the body that was given for us. Father, may we partake of this in a way that will be pleasing to you. In Jesus we pray, amen.
in the sacrificing of the lamb. The blood was the central focal point of that sacrifice. Jesus, as he sacrificed himself or allowed himself to be sacrificed, shed his blood. And then particularly, we think about leading up to the placement on the cross and that it, he'd already shed some through the torture and, and, and misuse that he had gone through. But then as he hung upon the cross and the spear was placed, was thrust into his side, water and blood is said to have gushed out. Jesus gave his life blood that we might have life with him. We partake of this grape juice thinking of the blood of Jesus Christ and how it was shed for us. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you again for Jesus. We thank you for his death and for the blood that he shed. And Father, we thank you that he rose again. And through all of this, we know that we can have life eternal with you as well. Again, Father, we pray that we may partake of this in a way pleasing to you. It's in Jesus that we pray. Amen. This will be our song before our prayer before the collection. We'll sing all three verses. All that all Christ for me I sigh when to a radio program yesterday evening and they were kind of going over some of our national history that is not always taught or are quickly remembered but they were talking about Benjamin Franklin and telling about how one day he was sitting in a revival meeting listening uh, to a renowned speaker of that day. And as he sat down, he, he thought to himself, you know, I'm, I, I know what's going, this is all going to lead up to. They're going to ask for an offering after a bit. But I tell you, I'm not going to give anything. He thought about what he had in his pocket. He had some, some copper coins and a few silver coins. 
And, well, one gold, $5 gold piece. But he is this dynamic man was preaching the Word of God and Benjamin Franklin remembered how he he began to be stirred by God's Word and kind of relented after a bit. And he said, well, when they get to the collection, I'll give my copper coin to him. And the sermon went on and he continued to be stirred in spirit and he began to think, you know, maybe I'll give my silver coins at the collection, but no more. But the gospel continued to be heard. And then at the end, the preacher finishing with the prayer, the collection was made and Benjamin Franklin emptied his pockets into the collection because he wanted to be a part at this point in God's work. God's work has always been carried on and sponsored by free will offerings. But God wants from us in our contribution to Him and our giving to the collection, He wants it to be from a heart that is touched and moved by His Word. We don't pass the plate here anymore, not right now anyway, but we have several different options on, on how to, to give of your money. We've got a uh, basket over here, we've got one over here, and then we've got methods to do it by uh, on, online. I can't tell you how to do it. You can uh, ask uh, one of the elders or probably most anyone else in here how, how that's set up and how you can do it. Uh, but that, that's one way, and of course you can mail it in as well. But we want to take a little bit of time in our service to think about our giving and how our giving supports the work that we do here uh, and whether it be talking about our mission work or uh, just keeping the building comfortable and, or whatever it might be but we want to uh, keep that in mind as we go through this worship assembly and uh, so as we think about that, would you bow in prayer with me? Our Father, we thank you for our many, many blessings. We, we have been blessed in so many ways, and financially we're blessed. Uh, it's a blessing to have opportunities to serve. And as we're thinking at this moment about our contribution, our financial support. We pray, Father, that you will, through your word, touch our hearts so that we may give liberally, so that we may, might give with a cheerful heart. Most of all, Father, we pray that we will give so as it to be pleasing to you. It's through Jesus that we pray. Amen. closing song today will be Joy to the World. This is a song I think gets shied away from unnecessarily. It kind of gets lumped in with the Christmas carol. It's not really what it is, but it's got a lot of great words in there. The Lord has come, the Savior reigns, He rules the world. So maybe as we kind of wrap things up, we'll kind of think of that idea of joy. And we'll be singing first, second, and last verse of this. Joy to the world. Thank you.
Let us bow and have a closing prayer. Dear Lord, we are so thankful to be here this morning to sing songs of praise unto you, to study a portion of your word, to have fellowship with those who are like-minded. We're so thankful for this time that we've had. We're so thankful, Lord, for your continued love and care for us. We're thankful that you brought us here safely. We're so thankful, Lord, for the the love and care that you've had for Ed Lawrence and that he was able to receive a kidney. We're so thankful, Lord, that he's doing well. We ask that you would continue to be with him and, and watch over him and strengthen him at this time. We pray, Lord, you would just be with all those who are sick at this time. We ask you to be with Carolyn Bickford. Watch over her and strengthen her in this time. Be with those who are to help her, that they will help her in the way that is best. Be with her family at this time also, Lord, and all the different concerns that are going on. We pray that you would strengthen them and help them in this time and guide them in this time. We pray, Lord, you would just be with each one of us and help us in all that we do, that we are striving to further the work on this earth that uh, Christ has brought to us. Help us in every opportunity that we have to bring more souls unto you. Just pray, Lord, you would just continue to guide us and help us in all things that we do, that we are striving to please you, not to please man, but to please you, Lord. And it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.